them? Can we blackmail them? This is serious national security stuff. And Anthem, as one of the biggest health insurers, has a lot of people who are paid a lot of money to protect that network. So, and they got hit really bad. I mean, worse than almost any company I've covered. So if that's the standard, if a company like that can get hit as hard as Anthem, you know, the wellness company, the third party uh, you know, consultant coming into your workplace, which doesn't have nearly the resources of an Anthem, you know, do, you, do you trust them to protect your data? Because these are the companies that are being targeted by hackers. And that's, that's the area that, that I come from. So just as, as a sense of level setting, the data is very vulnerable in a number of, of areas. And it's not hyperbole, it's not uh, it's scare tactics, it's real, it's happening. It happened with Anthem. You know, Sony Pictures, you know, that health data that the HR department kept on its internal servers was leaked uh, by the hackers. So HR departments have a ton of data, it's all vulnerable. Your health insurers have a ton of data, it's all vulnerable. And the wellness uh, companies that, uh, you know, that collect this data also have it as well. And just some very quick statistics before I introduce our panelists. You know, we've got uh, most U.S. firms use wellness programs. So most of the people in here, uh, if you work for a large company, uh, you know, will have had the opportunity to participate in one of these, these programs. It's a $6 billion industry. Um, you know, half of all U.S. firms use a wellness program. Half, 80% uh, of all large companies use a wellness program. Uh, and most importantly, the concerns that we're going to be discussing today, as well as at this conference, are not limited to folks with an interest in privacy, whether they're journalists or, or, or law professors or, or the like. Uh, a recent survey by The Economist showed that you know, a half of employees who were subject to wellness programs expressed some concern about sharing their data, and a quarter of those said they wouldn't share their data under any circumstances. So this is a pretty broad concern. Even more so than internet marketing and things like that, this is something that touches employees at, at the most basic level. It's their family's livelihood. It's the, uh, you know, the livelihood of their, um, you know, of their children. It's a, it's a very important issue. And you know, with all that said, I will, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to our panelists. We've got a great panel. We've got uh, Lindsay Wiley with uh, American uh, University, an associate professor of law. We've got Ifoma Ajunwa with uh, University of, uh, of, uh, of District Columbia Law School. Assistant Professor of Law. We've got Craig Conniff uh, with the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and we've got Michelle Demoy with uh, with the uh, Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, you know, I've asked these folks to give kind of a, a brief overview of some of their areas of research. I'll quickly outline them here, and then we can go into some, some discussion, some Q and A. Very, very quickly, we're going to be talking about are wellness programs effective for public health? We talk a lot about are they effective for the bottom line. Uh, these folks have done some really interesting research on are they effective for the public health? Are some of the penalties and incentives legal? Uh, that's an open question. That's not an answered question. And privacy and security concerns. So with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Lindsay. Do you have a, sure. some overview uh, material to share as well? So I'm, I'm not really a privacy person, a health privacy person. I'm a public health law person. And so I've been looking at wellness programs from that perspective. I'm also particularly interested in the use of wellness programs as what we call a, a way of backdoor underwriting, introducing discrimination based on health status through these wellness incentives, um, which is the main kind of regulatory issue that um, is dealt with with wellness programs under the Affordable Care Act. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we know about employer trends with regard to these programs, what employers are doing, um, what we know about whether these um, programs, and I'm going to focus on those that make heavy use of financial incentives, what we know about whether those are effective for changing people's health behavior or improving their health status, um, and a little bit about legal regulation and how it's changing under the Affordable Care Act. So a bit about context, about why everyone's so interested in wellness programs right now. And what's going on is under the Affordable Care Act, we have a shift in how we pay for health care toward what's called a mutual aid approach, a more collective approach to health care financing, as opposed to what's called actuarial fairness, the idea that each person pays according to what they're likely to use in terms of health benefits, a move away from that and toward a system where we pay um, somewhat more equally or even with regard to subsidies from the government according to our means, a means-based payment, um, and then we use what we need. Um, and that's very controversial. I don't need to say more about why that's controversial. Within the context of this shift, though, there's pushback um, that, ha that, that is present in the very statute um, of the Affordable Care Act, right? So in the context of this, what is really subsidization 
of more intensive healthcare users by less intensive users, and protection of people who are perceived to be likely to be intensive healthcare users. We also have what, what I call personal responsibility reforms within the ACA itself. And so the ACA has five basic provisions um, that, I, that I put in this category, all of which relate to some extent to, to wellness incentives. Um, and that's the language that's used, wellness. Um, wellness sounds like a very positive thing, as Jordan mentioned. Um, but some of us have actually started, uh, there's actually a great article by a colleague of mine called Against Wellness, pointing out some of the ways in which this seemingly innocuous term is being used in, in some pretty insidious ways. So um, we have sponsorship of a report investigating employer trends. A lot of the data that I'm going to um, present today is from that RAND report that came out in 2013, again, commissioned by um, the agencies under pursuant to a statutory mandate. We have expansion of HIPAA's wellness program exception. And here, I'm not talking about the HIPAA that you all are used to talking about. Um, as I say to my students, the P in HIPAA, there's only one P in HIPAA, which they often need to remind <laughs> of. Um, and it doesn't stand for privacy. It stands for portability. Um, so we're really talking now about the portability provisions in HIPAA, those that are aimed at non-discrimination in health premiums, right, for large, for employer-based plans, for group plans. Um, there's an exception that was in the HIPAA statute itself that allowed employers to vary the terms of coverage as part of a wellness program. That was very vaguely defined and then fleshed out in regulations, and then it's been expanded somewhat in the Affordable Care Act, which expands that non-discrimination requirement to all health insurance plans, not just group, group plans. Um, there was also um, a couple of demonstration projects, one to take this wellness program model and move it out of the kind of group employer-based plan and into the individual health insurance market, and another to create grants and support for small businesses to initiate wellness programs, whereas it's typically been larger employers that have done so in the past. And finally, a Medicaid grant program to give money to states um, to explore the use of financial incentives for wellness um, for Medicaid recipients as opposed to private health insurance, um, uh, uh, people covered by private insurance. So I'm, I'm going to use, give you a few categories for thinking about, you know, this broad category of wellness programs is actually used to mean a lot of very different things that employers are doing. Um, so the more positive side from a public health standpoint is what I call employer responsibility programs. And these are situations where employers are making the food offerings in their cafeteria healthier, are you know, creating walking paths on their work campus, um, uh, offering gym memberships, things like that that just facilitate behavior change without um, directly incentivizing or coercing behavior change, just making the healthy choice the easy choice is what we say in the public health community. What I'm more interested in are these personal responsibility programs that encourage or incentivize or penalize employees to make change, uh, to encourage them to make changes without necessarily doing anything to make it easier for them to make those changes. Um, I'm also going to do two categories of incentives. So when we talk about either on an experimental basis or in the context of a wellness program, incentives related to health behaviors, there are really two different, very different types. One I'll call medical compliance. So those are incentives um, for a discrete task, something like take, showing up with your child for a well child visit at the pediatrician, um, showing up for the third in a series of shots um, that, that you know, it's not going to be effective. Your symptoms are going to feel better, but it's not going to be effective for preventing transmission unless you get that third shop, shot. Let's offer you a gift card if you show up for the third shot. Those kinds of incentives are medical compliance, taking medications on time, showing up for appointments. Um, what I've been more interested in is um, incentives, and employers have been very interested in, is incentives for lifestyle compliance. And that's mostly been focused on tobacco use, um, weight loss, and phys physical fitness. Um, what we know from experimental studies, which are controlled and therefore you know, the, the results are a little more reliable, um, what we know from experimental studies is that incentives can be quite effective for medical compliance, for discrete kind of one-off tasks. They can work pretty well. For lifestyle compliance, uh, at best I can say the results are mixed, um, but really they're, they're, it's pretty clear that they aren't very effective, that financial incentives um, really don't work nearly as well as we kind of intuitively think that they would, um, especially when they're 
they're applied not in the context of a, a, of a natural social network, but rather in sort of an artificial context, um, like an experimental study or even a workplace. Um, what we find is that they have minimal impact. So one long-term study found an average of one pound weight loss, and that that impact diminishes over time. There's also a rebound effect that's more significant when the, in, in, when the change has been in, in response to a financial incentive than when it's been undertaken for some other, you know, other reason. So for example, smokers who quit in response to financial incentives are more likely to return to smoking. Those who lose weight in response to financial incentives are more more likely, and you're already very likely in both of these situations to rebound, but you're even more likely when you um, initiated that change in response to an incentive. Um, so what do we know about employers? The majority of employers, as Jordan said, with 50 or more employees have some form of wellness program, but that includes both employer responsibility and personal responsibility programs. Um, these cover, uh, programs cover about 75% of workers in the US. Um, about a, a quarter of employers who don't yet have wellness programs say that they intend to start one in the very near future. Um, and those numbers have been consistent and they've been borne out by increasing proportion of employers who do have programs year over year. About 80% of these programs include health screenings. And, and if you have experience with one of these programs, that probably sounds about right to you. Um, uh, if you show up for this on-site at work health screening or go to your doctor for a health screening, we'll give you a little discount um, on your premium or waive some co-pays. About 70% of those aren't just a questionnaire, a health risk assessment, but also collect biometric data um, in the context of a, of a health screening. Um, and that can include height, weight, BMI, blood pressure, blood glucose, blood cholesterol, or, or more. Um, some of these programs are for employees only. Others include dependents as well. There's less reliable data on the percentages there. Um, I want to say a bit about these health screenings because this gets into my backdoor underwriting idea. These are this very similar to the health screenings that were used by insurance companies for underwriting purposes. They're asking the same questions, they're collecting the same information. Um, but the wellness program, right, so, so what's going on is those health screenings for underwriting purposes are prohibited um, for group plans under HIPAA, for all plans now under the ACA, or, or virtually all plans under the ACA. Um, but a well, the wellness program exception, basically wellness programs are encouraged by this regulatory exception that says you can't underwrite based on health, health status related factors, but you can collect this information, do these screenings, and vary the terms of coverage in the context of a wellness program. So um, about 70% of these programs are applying some sort of financial incentives, and that's what really matters under the ACA. The employer responsibility programs um, are, are not concerning from the standpoint of the ACA. Um, uh, uh, most of these are tied to participation only. Just show up for the health screening and you get the incentive, not to any sort of results from the health screening yet. Um, but about half of large employers tie incentives, financial incentives, directly to smoking status, um, whether you are a smoker or not. 18% um, tie incentives directly to biomarkers, so not to just participation, not to submitting for the test, but to the results of the test. Um, and nearly 50% say that they intend to move more in that direction in the future. So there's a lot of employer interest, specifically in tying financial incentives to biomarkers, um, to the results of those health screenings, not just participation. Additionally, 20% of smoking cessation, 6% of fitness, 3% of weight loss tie incentives not just to participating in those programs, but to achievement of specified goals as part of those programs. Actual weight loss, actual increase in how many steps your app or your smartwatch says that you've taken that day, um, uh, actual smoking cessation for a defined period of time. Those measurements are sometimes by self-report, but increasingly by biometric marker as well, right? So um, urine testing for smoking status, for tobacco use, for example, or weigh-ins um, for weight loss. Um, it's unknown. I just want to introduce some additional categories. Um, there are two categories where there's regulatory ambiguity here. And, and we haven't collected data about those two types of programs either, but there are anecdotal reports that suggest they're quite prevalent. One I'll call two-tier. 
And what I mean there is the first step is, do you have this status or not? Are you a smoker or not? Do, is your BMI over you know, 29 or not? And those who have the favored status automatically get the, the incentive, the financial incentive, or avoid the penalty. Those who don't then um, go into a second tier and are offered some alternate route to get the same incentive or maybe less, um, a lesser incentive. And maybe that's participation in a program. Maybe it's achievement um, of a specified goal that's less, you know, less than achieving the full status. Um, the other is a targeted program, meaning the health screening um, identifies certain people and then offers them an incentive um, based on some sort of risk um, factor that's been identified. But that incentive is not offered to everyone. Um, all right, so under HIPAA, HIPAA defined health factors, said what wasn't allowed in terms of underwriting, and then it created this um, statutory exception. Then you get a 2006 rule that elaborates the regulatory requirements. Um, and and the, again, the statute was very vague. So the 2006 rule really elaborates it quite a bit. But again, unclear under the 2006 rule where those targeted and two-tier programs fell. Um, there was participation only and standard-based were the two main categories there. Um, then what happens with the ACA is the ACA statute takes the text of the 2006 rule and incorporates it directly into the statute um, and doubles down a little bit, says that those incentives can be um, for an even higher amount. They can go up to 30% rather than 20 of the full contribution um, and even as high as 50%, um, which the secretaries have now done for smoking only. Um, then you have a 2013 rule, and that's the really interesting part. The 2013 rule takes this text and elaborates even further, but remember it came from a 2006 rule to begin with, and that 2013 rule resolves that ambiguity over those two-tier and targeted programs, and it resolves it in a way that makes it, that, that makes it less favorable to employers, makes it less, a less friendly regulatory environment for employers pursuing these programs. Um, and what I'm finding with that 2013 rule and some other actions by um, HHS, um, and I just have some examples here, I won't go into them in detail, um, is that they indicate that HHS, at least under the Obama administration, um, is what I believe justi is justifiably skeptical toward these programs um, based on the lack of evidence of their effectiveness from a cost saving standpoint overall. They may save employers, individual employers costs by shifting those costs to employees, but it's not at all clear that in the long term they're actually improving health status or saving health care costs for us um, on the whole, um, has made it less a less favorable regulatory environment environment for employers to pursue these programs. Um, and I have another couple of examples. So just in conclusion, um, third party payers, whether they're employers self-insuring or health plans who are um, uh, fully insured for group plans, their incentives may not be fully aligned with sound prevention policy. Um, and that's because the, of the latency period, right, between the behavior of smoking or, 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 um, or eating habits or physical activity and the health consequences. And then also how dynamic the health insurance market is. People tend to change their coverage um, quite a bit over the course of a lifetime. And so your employer's health plan is unlikely to ultimately bear those costs. They are gonna bear the cost of your contribution, right? Their contribution on your behalf. And if they can shift more of that to the employee, they're absolutely gonna save money at that point. But that shifting doesn't necessarily align with sound prevention. So that's that's um, my main point here, and I'll, I'll move on at that point. Actually, thank you for that, Lindsay. I'm thinking the best way to do this going forward is, you know, I've talked to, talked to all you folks before, and I think we can, let's just do a discussion about some of the key areas that you guys, uh, you guys have, have, uh, have talked about. I think that would be, um, um, you know, we've uh, we've all talked about some uh, you know some really interesting areas, and, and I think uh, if I might, you know, we'll, t we'll start with you. You know, we one of the things that we discussed that I really liked was this, um, you know, this idea that it's not always an external company that manages the data. Can you talk to me, talk to us a little bit about that? And uh, you know, I think we tend to think of wellness programs as as third party, kind of external, <laughs> firewalled off from from the corporation you work for, but that's not always the case. Um, yeah, that's that's actually true. Um, so there's no actual law that says that uh, wellness programs have to be externally managed. Obviously, it makes good uh, sense that they should be because that might provide an extra layer of privacy uh, for the employees, but there's no actual law that says that, um, such that um, employers can have in-house wellness programs that they basically designate an office or maybe the HR for. And as you can imagine, this presents uh, great 
uh, concerns, uh, both for privacy and also for employment discrimination. Um, now, Lindsay mentioned two things that I actually focus on for my research, and um, that is the fitness trackers and also the smoking cessation programs. Um, and actually, one third thing, which is also the um, weight reduction programs. Um, so I'll start with the, I think I, I'll, I'll start with why I focus on the uh, technology, really, which is a fitness tracker. So um, basically, I situate wellness programs within the realm of quantified work, um, which is an emerging um, phenomenon in American society. And what do I mean by quantified work? Well, uh, the workplace has increasingly become an arena where uh, quantification or what is now seen as a mythology of big data plays out. And it's the idea that um, anything or the risk associated with anything can be quantified. It can be represented by numbers or percentages. So uh, in the workplace, employers are seeking to discover uh, both productivity of employees and also the risks associated with having a certain employee uh, through numbers. And wellness programs is a way of quantifying that because for them, it's a way of quantifying uh, how much is this person going to cost me in terms of healthcare costs? And how much is this person actually useful to the uh, corp uh, corporation in terms of productivity? And they believe this can be measured by the employee's health. Um, so what is new, however, is, so I guess, Wellness programs are not new in the sense that um, there has always been workplace surveillance, right? Um, so starting in, in 1910, Louis Brandeis um, is credited with popularizing the term uh, scientific management. And what, is, what that is is basically the idea that um, the employer can study uh, worker output and, and can actually develop a system to maximize productivity. And as, you, as some of you know, this was, um, uh, this was adopted by Taylor, um, and it gave rise to Taylorism, uh, wherein the focus was on analyzing employee uh, workflows with the primary goals of achieving uh, economic efficiency and labor productivity. Uh, unlike Taylorism, uh, however, the focus now is not just on the job task itself and on determining ways to make it more efficient or more effectively uh, uh, productive uh, in terms of work. The focus now is on the workers' bodies. Uh, the, the employers are now focused on managing the employers' bodies to achieve maximum productivity and uh, to achieve uh, the least healthcare costs. And the, the employers now are also, as my colleague mentioned, relegating that responsibility of managing the employees' bodies to the employee themselves. So that is what is really new. Um, what concerns us, or should concern us about this, is that it actually opens a back door to both privacy violations and also uh, uh, new ways to discriminate, right? Um, so in terms of the privacy violations, um, I'll talk about the fitness trackers. What some people might not realize is that any employer-provided device remains the property of the employer. That means uh, employer provided uh, cell phones, employer provided uh, laptops, and also fitness trackers. What that means is that the employer may access the data from those devices without the permission of the worker. This is perfectly legal. So if your employer gives you a Fitbit or a Jawbone, they can access the data from that. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the uh, wellness programs that have either smoking cessation or obesity. There are also uh, issues with that because uh, employment discrimination laws really only cover uh, pregnancy, disability, race discrimination, and sex discrimination. So obesity is generally not a protected category under employment discrimination laws. Now, some jurisdictions uh, treat obesity as a disability, but even then, uh, the person has to be so morbidly obese that the obesity affects their life activities, such as walking, etc. So somebody that is moderately obese uh, would still not be protected by that law. And then 
we come to the use of BMI. So uh, body mass index is actually merely uh, a calculation based on height and weight. What is an issue with that is that there's no distinction between fat mass and muscu muscle mass. So somebody that is very muscular will actually read as obese if you use body mass index alone. Um, this is of, obviously of concern because if somebody who is very muscular is made to join a, a, a weight loss program, they're not going to lose weight <laughs> because that is their genetic predisposition. And then they might be penalized uh, for that, even though they're perfectly healthy. And then I, I wanna speak about the smoking cessation programs. So what is interesting about the smoking cessation program is that smoking is also not a federally protected category when it comes to employment discrimination. And in fact, in five states in the United States of America, an employee may be fired from work for smoking outside of the workplace. So this might sound strange to people, but this is perfectly legal. And I'll tell you the states in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> they are Alabama, Alaska, uh, Florida, Georgia, and Massachusetts and Texas. So keep that in mind if you do live in any of those states. You may not want to tell your employer that you're a smoker or join a smoking cessation program. So these are new and insidious ways that employment discrimination can take place because these categories are not federally protected. So we need to keep this in mind. And in conclusion, I think I want to focus our attention on the new ways we need to think about the research of wellness programs. Um, so my colleague mentioned the return on investment and some of the, uh, some of the uh, studies that have been done, right? Uh, so previously, there was a study that was um, published in the Harvard Business Review. And that study basically claimed a $6 return on investment for wellness programs. And, it, and that calculation was derived off cost. $3 for productivity, increase in productivity, and $3 for decrease in absenteeism, right, based due to illness. Uh, well, the RAND Corporation study, which came out in 2013, uh, essentially disproved that study. Um, the RAND Corporation f study found no stati statistically significant savings when it came to healthcare uh, based on wellness programs. So this is something we need to keep in mind. But frankly, I feel, I f I feel that both studies are rather narrow. They're rather short-sighted. Because what those studies don't uh, measure are employee morale and employee turnover. So if we're focusing on return investment, we can't really just focus on productivity or um, lack of absenteeism. We actually have to focus on employee morale because yes, the employees are showing up, but if they're anxious, uh, because they feel they have to lose weight or anxious because they, they're worried um, that if they don't quit smoking, they're going to be fired. How productive are they? And also, how much longer will they want to stay at such a company where they feel uh, surveilled, essentially, for their personal, uh, uh, for the personal facets of their life, you know, for smoking outside of the workplace. So I think future research really needs to expand its focus to look at those areas. Um, and then we also need to look more, I feel, at the vendors uh, of uh, wellness programs. So um, at the start of, my, of the conversation, I talked more about the wellness program, programs that are managed by the employers themselves, but that's usually in the minority, actually. So the large corporate companies actually have vendors um, who manage their wellness programs. And I feel that there's more research to be done there in terms of the vendors who are managing these wellness programs, what are they doing with the data they are collecting? Are there actual regulations that manage how that data is stored, right? I mean, we no. live in the world of data breaches, right? Are there regulations that manage if that data can be sold uh, to uh, advertising companies? We've heard of, about, we all know about targeted advertising and the issues with privacy arising from that. So I think you know, future research needs to focus on that. 
And then finally, I think future research needs to also focus on the accuracy of the technology that's being used in wellness programs. And the reason is that so they have in studies showing that uh, several fitness trackers are actually inaccurate in terms of measuring both activity and um, measuring, I guess, the quality of activity. So, for example, uh, if you go online, there's, uh, there's a website called On Fitbits, and it basically shows you all the ways you can game uh, a Fitbit, essentially. <laughs> um, one of the ways meaning being that you can sit at your desk and use a drill and just whirl the <laughs> Fitbit around, and you will have run a thousand miles. <laughs> so, so obviously this you know, is, is an issue, and then some of the fitness trackers don't actually register if you're riding a bike. Riding a bike takes off, obviously a lot of energy, so if a fitness tracker is not able to register that, then that is a problem, considering that some people actually commute to work via bike. So um, in conclusion, you know, we have, I think, a lot of room for more research into wellness programs, and we need to not be short-sighted and just uh, focus on the return of investment in terms of just healthcare savings. We need to look at actual, the actual panorama of issues uh, related to both privacy and employment discrimination. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, um, And Craig, I want to talk with you a little bit about, uh, we had this interesting discussion. You got this idea that you know, wellness programs create this kind of bizarre parallel universe for healthcare which I guess I hadn't thought about it this way before, but I have my primary you know, care physician, I've got the hospital I go to, and then I have the wellness program that my employer has set up, which if you're with an employer for a long time, has really interesting longitudinal data about you that is not connected to your, your other healthcare system. I'd love it if you yeah. could talk about that. No, yeah. Absolutely, and because I'm um, not entertaining enough before noon, or some would say before happy hour without slides, um, I have some of those. Um, so, uh, so first I just want to thank Deborah Peel, Frank Pasquale, um, and Patient Privacy Rights uh, for organizing this important conference every year. Um, I want to argue for the integration of wellness programs into the healthcare system. Um, I first consider ambitiously, perhaps, what the essential goals of a wellness program should be. If wellness program goals um, are workplace specific in some way, then integrating wellness may not make much sense. Um, second, assuming that wellness program goals are not work workplace specific, how should we integrate wellness programs into the broader healthcare apparatus through improving information flows between the programs and clinical care, and what are its benefits? So, oh, is this, okay. Okay, so um, I, may, I don't know if this is, I may have to hold my hand up like that. Um, so, so at the outset, wellness programs constitute a shift from standard healthcare. Um, in the standard system, health-related interactions um, usually occurred in the clinical context. Frequently, a single doctor, such as a primary care provider, would oversee all of the cl clinical interactions. Today, the growth of health information exchanges and other means for examining cl clinical information allows, in many instances, all clinical personnel that interact with the patient to have an overview of all these interactions and to reduce the fragmentation of care. Wellness programs, however, increase such fragmentation. They remain outside the loop, um, and uh, wellness programs are often assessed according to the extent to which they decrease your interactions with these clinical um, uh, resources. Information collected through wellness programs and the interventions themselves are not integrated into the clinical experience. They are a health world unto themselves. Now, this siloed approach uh, may be justified if a wellness program had you know, only job-specific goals that aren't applicable more broadly. Uh, the RAND report um, on wellness programs, which I think you'll hear about shortly, um, which remains one of the most thorough overviews of these programs, offers us two different metrics to evaluate wellness programs as a whole, which in turn suggest two different goals. The first is improvements in health behavior and the status of the employees. The second is the effect on healthcare costs for the employer. On one hand, both metrics appear to reinforce each other. Healthier workers mean lower healthcare costs in theory, um, and health and savings um, therefore um, mutually support each other. 
Oh, yeah, that's it. But um, as I'm sure many realize, but few discuss, the two metrics are not directed at achieving the same goal. Um, I think uh, that's what undergirds a lot of the concerns of um, you know, my colleagues on the panel here today. Um, optimizing an employee's health over the long term may never redound to the benefit of the employer. It may, for example, reduce the risk of a stroke or heart attack later in life, long after the employee has left the workforce. But because many employers do not provide post-retirement coverage, they don't pay for such conditions. Indeed, in industries where employees regularly move from company to company, the employer's bottom line concerns only very short-term health outcomes. Thus, optimizing the overall health of the employee doesn't really inure to the employer's bottom line. Uh, this problem reflects a deeper problem involving trade-offs. So sometimes to maximize profitability, especially in the short term, an employer may quite conceivably need to make demands that negatively affect the health of the employee. Thus, la last minute demands, weekend work shifts, or hazardous employment conditions, there are lawyers in this room, so um, I, I, they, I'm sure we know all about those, um, may all make an employee sicker, but may improve the employer's bottom line far more than a wellness program could. Sure, maybe some low-cost programs could be put into place to counteract the immediate effects um, of these job-related uh, issues, which in turn would maximize productivity. But here the employer will be using health programs to fashion optimum health um, outcomes for the bottom line and, and let health lapse when it is profitable for the employer. So the goals of health and profitability are fellow travelers only some of the time. So while many studies, including some that have been discussed here today, uh, focus on questions of employer cost, my own suspicion or hope is that many employers see the health of their employee as the key goal. I hope. Um, so cost is only considered as a limiting factor. In other words, employers hopefully independently, the value, in, independently value the health of the, the employee and will take steps to improve it even if it affects the bottom line a little bit, but only a little bit. So let me present to you at least three reasons why this approach, which understands wellness programs about employee health um, rather than as employer profitability, best conforms to, the, to existing legal principles and social norms. Um, so first, wellness programs are about life, not work. Uh, they are a shift in scope from the classical model of employer health coverage, as Ifeoma talks, talked about. So under that classical model, the reach of the health program through the employer or the insurance company was limited. As I noted earlier, you only interacted with the program when you were sick and receiving some form of medical care. Um, thus, in the case of mo this in the case of most individuals, limited the interaction both, both in terms of the number of days um, as well as the kinds of activities um, with the, with, with, with the uh, medical um, apparatus. Second, the interaction with the program itself was mediated through health providers, doctors, pharmacists, and others. In companies with wellness programs, these limits are breached. Employees now are pressured to the extent that there are participation incentives to open up other areas of their lives, um, smoking at home, for example, their daily regimen, what they eat, whether they exercise, and even their leisure behavior. And so subjecting vast swaths of one's life to the end of employer profitability is completely inappropriate and unconscionable. Second, we forget this, but work is also about life. Um, who would have thought? Um, so theorists of work have uh, long disputed how work should be defined as distinct from life in some way. But nearly all of them concede that the definition must be a fuzzy one. I myself, and you know, perhaps because I'm a geek both at work and at home, um, subscribe to the theory that work cannot be excised from life. Of course, we spend most of our waking hours on the job, but work also, for many people, represents fulfillment, individual growth, um, and it, it is an important part of human flourishing and often sets life goals. Because of that, the businesses in which our jobs are situated must take into account other goals beyond profitability as they operate. Wellness programs for me are a perfect representation of the fuzzy boundary um, and a perfect opportunity to do something about the fact that our life often lies in our work. Again, under the classical model of coverage, the employer did not much consider the question of employee health precisely because those questions were siloed off from work and dealt with only in specific contexts. Making the employer realize how day-to-day -day life and work affects employee health will potentially make employers consider not just how the employee's off-the-job choices affects their health, but hopefully how the job itself can affect health and stress levels. And as a result, hopefully employers will institute changes that affect not only off-the-job lifestyle choices, but also ones that affect the job, um, uh, what the job itself looks like. But I digress. Finally, 
Um, as a general matter, basic employer health benefits are no longer about profitability. Um, the Affordable Care Act imposes an employer mandate on employers above a certain size. Industry objected, Senator Orrin Hatch called this the job killing initiative. Um, the, the mandate, however, was justified because it maximized health coverage rather than on business grounds. Even though they are voluntary, employer wellness programs should similarly be assessed, primarily at least, um, as the, uh, based on the effects on employee health. So, so far, I've tried to show that employer wellness programs should be primarily, at least, about improving employee health, not employer profitability. Now, that's an important point, I think, by itself. However, if wellness programs are not designed to engage with employees as part of a business interaction, but rather they are about working with individuals to improve their health, then they must be integrated into healthcare more generally. It makes no sense for there to exist two separate healthcare paradigms um, that operate independently and maybe, maybe even redundantly each other. Uh, so the rules accompanying the ACA, uh, however, only anticipate a role for a personal physician um, when a, the employee needs to seek a modification from wellness program cr criteria. But the physician, I think, can play a bigger role. Uh, first, the nature of the program and the kinds of interventions involved should be communicated to all individuals' physicians. Further, the performance um, of the individual should be conveyed uh, to the physicians. This can be done either by em the employee or the employer. Metrics for these interventions um, uh, may, may either be made reportable by com comparative effectiveness research um, and, and other means, and all other confidentially, uh, pra confidentiality practice would remain intact. Um, as the Office for the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology begins to consider capacity building beyond the Medicare and Medicaid context, I think it should take into account how information from employers can flow to doctors and vice versa. Um, so conveying this information has at least five benefits that I will touch upon here only briefly uh, in the interest of time. Um, first, I believe that integrating wellness programs into the standard healthcare apparatus will reinforce the principle that the primary goals of the programs is to improve the employee's wellness, not the employer's bottom line. This is a good, I think, in itself. Second, one of the biggest concerns about wellness programs is that they may um, take place without proper clinical supervision. Um, my approach, I think, helps address uh, this concern. Third, I think there should be a provision, and I think this will inter interest you all, that allows an employee's personal physician to certify to the employer that the employee is in compliance with various wellness program requirements um, without specifying what these details are and you know, detailed biometrics. I think this would improve confidentiality uh, because there will no longer be redundant data collection um, by employers who may or may not be subject to HIPAA. Um, fourth, to the extent that clinical data is being agglomerated to determine best practices under um, high tech and other provisions, um, and the comparative effectiveness, uh, comparative effectiveness of treatment, wellness program outcomes may be compared to other forms of, um, well, uh, of medical intervention. Um, and as Lindsay's work suggests, this may result in our shifting the shape of these programs or even downsizing them because other inter interventions prove to be far more effective than these. Finally. Um, by increasing the links between healthcare and the workplace in a sustained manner, my hope is that the culture of health and well-being will permeate the workplace. This may result in reimagining how employees should be treated and the nature of work itself. Thank you. Okay. And Michelle, I'm sorry, we're running a little bit short of time. I want to make sure we get some questions. But uh, one thing that stuck <laughs> out when we were um, when we were talking mm -hmm. was the role of the EEOC, and you know, mm -hmm. we've written about. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about earlier some employees uh, you know, filing lawsuits against their employers for mandating that they participate in wellness programs and punishing right. them if they don't. And you had an interesting take on you know, the EEOC's kind of shifting role in this. I mean, right. some of the earlier lawsuits. I should say maybe about face. Um, yeah. would be a better way to describe the EEOC <laughs> <laughs> at this moment in time. Um, it should maybe be a giant asterisk to uh, your proposal, which I think is interesting. But the, So the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission brought three lawsuits last year against companies alleging that they were using incentives as proxies for penalties. Um, you know, I think Honeywell was one of the companies, and they were using incentive penalties up to $2,000. So obviously that has a lot of ramifications, a lot of issues, for example, $2,000 looks very different if you're an executive versus an assistant. And whether you decide to do that looks very different. That decision looks very different. So the EEOC did that. Um, and then <laughs> in April, they issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in which they basically said that penalties were back in. 
penalties are okay. And and the way that they did this was they were trying to, um, what they saw, reconcile a tension between the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Affordable Care Act. So, um, which I disagree with, just um, to note. I don't think that these laws are in tension. I think they do different things. Um, I think they address different issues and both are perfectly reasonable. So obviously the ADA um, says that employers can't collect detailed personal medical information without a business related reason. And so um, obviously if you're using wellness programs and a lot of those have health risk assessments, biometric screenings attached to them, this, this um, comes into play. But the EEOC is saying that if you are in compliance with the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, under, under its provisions for wellness programs, then you are automatically in compliance with the ADA. So um, you know, we as, as privacy advocates and also civil, civil rights activists have an issue with that. Um, next up will be the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act. So that's problematic too. And I think it's, like I said, I think it's a huge asterisk to the idea of um, the you know sharing more and more information about employee employees with doctors and and sort of taking it beyond that ecosystem. It really brings up the question of whether these, the way they're implemented are legal. I mean the wellness program on its face is of course it's not just legal but mandated. But mm -hmm. uh, the way they're implemented at pretty much every employer. I mean this is a fundamental question about right. And these laws were were designed to protect us um, from discrimination. Period. Right. Um, and, and for these exact reasons. And they should remain in place. And, and you know, employers have ways of, of dealing with this tension um, and not and being more privacy protective, basically. Um, but that will change when the EEOC rules go into effect. So is it now considered an incentive or a penalty? I guess it's, you can look at it. What I think, well, this is all under, you know, what the EEOC is saying. Um, they are saying that penalties are acceptable. Based on this, you know, so some of the other, um, one of the other, a couple of the other interesting points that I would make. I, I don't want to go. I don't have a presentation. Um, that's not really my style. But um, I will say that the the idea of effectiveness, I think, is actually more of a question in my mind of ha actual harm. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think a point was made that the the financially incentivizing people to lose weight or or, or give up smoking actually causes them to be more likely to return to gaining weight and, and to smoking, which to me says that these financial incentives are actually causing harm. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an important note to make. The other- I um, just add really quickly on that mm -hmm. point that um, there's some evidence that weight cycling, that the cycle of losing and regaining weight is potentially as harmful or even more harmful than mm -hmm. maintaining a stable but unhealthy, categorized as unhealthy. Interesting, weight. yeah. And it, you know, maybe that's the case with smoking too. It would be interesting to know. I'm sure that that, that research is there. Um, the other question, the other point that I would make is that um, you know wearables, just from a commercial standpoint, are under tremendous pressure in the market. You know, there, there are a lot of different companies; they're all competing. Obviously, there's some who are sort of market leaders, like Fitbit and Jawbone, and Fitbit's actually going public soon. Um, so these these companies are under enormous pressure because the drop-off rate for use of them is very high. So it's something sort of, um, I've said before, it's the dirty little secret. I think I actually got that from a headline somewhere of, of this industry. And that is that something like 50% of users stop using these. And I wonder if any of you in the audience may be among those, myself included. I don't even know where it is anymore. So um, you know, it, it, they're useful to a point, but the drop-off rate is a problem if you're in this commercial space. And so what that has equaled, um, and in many cases, is more intensive collection of more personalized um, data, so biometric information, mm -hmm. things that tie you more closely to the device. Um, and so, of course, the more personal, the more biometric, the more identifiable. Mm -hmm. And that be that becomes a problem from a privacy perspective in lots of different ways. Um, and then the other point that I would want to I want to bring up is I'm actually doing a research project with Fitbit um, through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to map out their internal research processes. So it's sort of um, it's a something that people don't necessarily think about, but it's a way to consider how is the data being used in these companies, yeah. not just in wellness programs, because of course then it matters, right? It matters as it's deployed to wellness programs, et cetera. But how are these companies themselves? protecting the privacy and security of the vast, vast amount of data that they're collecting from us. Some companies um, you know, have access controls like Fitbit and they do that very well. But the question that I wanted to look at was how do they do internal research? 
So how do they figure out how to make it more effective, make it more accurate, which is another great pressure? Mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they decide what sort of behavioral interventions you know, are necessary for any given person or population or demographic? So um, I'll be publishing the results of that soon um, with CDT and with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But part of what I've been doing is ma literally mapping the internal research process to identify privacy pivot points. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is to give researchers, um, who oftentimes actually have a background in health policy, to give them some kind of understanding of where those pivot points might actually be, and to give them some guidance, whether it's, here's a best practice, here's a question you should be asking yourself, here's a compliance maybe issue, or could be down the road. Um, and so that's you know, a couple of the, just as teasers, a couple of the interesting things that I've learned is that for the most part at um, wearable companies, the actual research volunteers are employees. So they are volunteers and they, you know, are interested in their product. Obviously they want to be involved in it. However, it raises some coercion issues, just, you know, sort of a, a micro workplace wellness issue. Um, you know, how are people being incentivized to, to actually be the research subjects? And then the other, um, one of the other interesting um, issues that I've been looking at is the idea that the background of the employees really does matter quite a bit in terms of how they look at the data and how they decide where privacy comes in and security comes in. But when you have an informal process like that that relies on the employees, you have a company like Fitbit or you know the million you know the hundreds of startups that are out there right now. They explode into the market, and all of a sudden that is inadequate in a major way, and there's a lot of unprotected data. Ifama, you made, you made an interesting point earlier as well that's really important to make, uh, is that HIPAA doesn't apply generally to the employers or the wellness programs or the device makers. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are companies that exist entirely outside of the realm of, and this is an even bigger problem, of they're not a healthcare provider, they're not an mm -hmm. insurer, they're not a clearinghouse. So what they do with that data, you'll get companies talking a lot about, we subscribe to the HIPAA policies, we follow these, these procedures, it's voluntary, there's no mm -hmm. real oversight, mm -hmm. and there are no penalties if they, if they don't do it the right way. So right. it's good PR and it's good cover, mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think you made an important point about that. As yeah, well. I, yeah I, I was really interested to um, you know, see what um, companies are doing with the data, meaning the vendors themselves, right? And also, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my colleague brings up a good point about um, how the data is actually being interpreted, right? Because Mm -hmm. What the vendor company, or if it's the employer itself that's ad uh, administering the program, get is not the raw data. They get the interpretation of Fitbit or Jawbone. So I think your research is really fascinating and really, really uh, important because that's how we understand the black box, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we get to look into the black box and see what algorithms, right? Uh, being used to interpret the raw data, <laughs> and what you're getting to see are the um, sort of unspoken biases, right? The, mm -hmm. the assumptions that are built into the algorithms, which may not be accurate, which, you mm -hmm. know, as you're noting, you know, may be uh, derived in a way that wouldn't really fly for medical research, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of people that they're using as research subjects. Well, it's people. interesting, you know, we're actually doing another project at CDT okay. on that very issue of algorithms, and it's sort of a hot, hot topic, but one of the, you know, from my work, one of the intersections that I think is troubling is the idea that, you know, algorithms in our digital world sort of portray the digital wor world for us based on these algorithms. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, it's sort of like you, you open up your browser and what you see often depends on what algorithms have decided you should see. Okay. Something people don't necessarily understand that your, your web doesn't look the same, isn't the same web as it is for other people. And of course, when you talk about health, that, be, that becomes very troubling and concerning, yeah, exactly. considering what sort of offerings are available to you, what sort of health world is, is shown to you or not shown to you. Yeah. I think we have just a few minutes for some questions, if anybody wants to come up. Um, Lindsay, I'll, I was going to ask you as well, a, a, an important point you make as earlier was that the long-term, you know, ways to improve the public health long-term uh, you know, are costly, or they uh, step on the toes of companies with political clout. One of the examples you gave was, you know, if you are, let's say, a manufacturing facility or an office, you know, swapping out cola for water, mm -hmm. let's say, bottled water. I mean, you, you deal with these corporate interactions mm -hmm. that are you know, often quite fraught yeah. uh, for mm -hmm. companies and, yeah. and business deals that they have. Yeah, I, I think these personal responsibility reforms, it's, it's easy to see why they're so popular because they're politically very palatable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a lot of agreement, there's widespread agreement that, that 
we have a, a crisis of non-communicable disease, of chronic disease, but, but how we respond to that is, is very politically fraught. Um, uh, there's a lot of money at stake, um, both in terms of subjecting uh, food manufacturers or beverage manufacturers to more regulation, or in terms of you know expecting employers to take more responsibility, um, to not necessarily go with the vendor contract that's going to. I mean, what I found at my own workplace, for example, is that um, water. What there was no dispenser for water anywhere near the food service area. You had to bring your own or buy you know a two dollar bottle of water. And I mean, I'm a public health person, but when I'm faced with paying two dollars, I, I I sort of feel like, well, if I'm going to pay two dollars, I might as well get like sweetened tea or something. <laughs> it's water. That's plus it's tacky to have bottled water now. So, so, um, so I went to the food service manager and said, you know, how do we get water? And he said, well, you know, you can go all the way across the floor. There's a water dispenser on the other side of the building from the food service area. I said, yeah, how do we get it in here next to the soda? And he looked into it and found that Coke, who was the vendor, um, had said no had said, no, you can't use any of our you know, spigots on our little dispenser for water. And what they tried to say was, well, you, it just doesn't work with the machine. It's not capable. And I was like, that's BS. I see that everywhere. It's because they know if you have water dispensed, people are going to choose the water, at least a significant proportion of them. So we're asking employers to take that kind of role is, is very tricky. Um, and it's a lot easier to say to them, well, why don't you, you know, charge some of your employees more and say that it's because you want the, those who, you know, everyone mm -hmm. to, to be healthier. Um, that's sure. a lot more palatable. Sure. Just one sure. Huh? Well, sure. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, there's plenty that you could say about wellness. I don't want to distract people too much, but I think it's really interesting to note that it's part of larger systems. And Ifioma was noting how it's part of measurement and Taylorism in the workplace. It's also related to problems of um, taking on risk in things like accountable care organizations, that doctors are also now responsible for making people lose weight, and they're going to lose money if you don't stop smoking and stuff. And a lot of doctors recognize that that's um, kind of setting them up to fail. I'll just say that. Oh, we, we could have maybe one more question. Yeah. I'll just say absolutely. <laughs> yeah. about accountable care organizations. We know very little about how to help people lose weight. And we're, a lot of our kind of legal reforms surrounding that are making really bad assumptions about what we know about how to help people be healthier. Mm -hmm. okay. This is a great panel. Uh, this was the uh, Safeway provision. I remember when I was in the Senate Finance Committee. Um, a coercive provision that doesn't appear to work very well, but is a major tap for data. Um, Lindsay, what I really appreciate you had to say was the distinction between participation and outcome. And I'm sorry, Bill Pugh with Marshall University, I didn't identify myself, used to be with Center Olympia Snow. Uh, the scenario we put out a number of times, and it comes right back to the bill and to, you know, privacy to me is civil rights. The scenario I put out a number of times when we were looking at this provision was this. Let's say I'm hyperlipidemic and you're hyperlipidemic. I'm okay with the idea of saying you have to participate and do something. Mm -hmm. If we both take Lipitor and I make the numbers and you don't, your premium goes up. It completely undermines the bill. Essentially, a 50% increase, and we're going to go there. The secretary's going to go there. First, it's smoking. It's going to go further. So we've got something that doesn't work. There's a data tap and that essentially violates the Genetic and Information Non-Discrimination Act mm -hmm. and a whole lot of other equity issues and civil rights. So I just want to say how much I appreciate the panel. I might just end too, and, and since you have inside information on this, my understanding is that the Affordable Care Act on the wellness program rules and under HIPAA, the wellness program rules, the understanding was always that those programs would also be subject to the ADA. And yes, Gina. that's correct. Mm -hmm. And so the, the EEOC rule is really troubling in that regard to, to say, well, as long as you're complying with this, mm -hmm. because the, the HHS rule was written with the understanding, well, they've also got to comply with so, the ADA. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Gina, and uh, there's a, uh, you know, public comment is open until June 19th, so I encourage everybody who feels hugely similarly to yeah. to This is a huge clawback in terms of premium, and yeah. it really yeah. impacts the folks in the mm -hmm. room. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I know we've, we've run out of time. I want to thank everybody on the panel. I'm sorry we've run out of time. I mean, we could talk about this for you know, a really long time, but yeah. really appreciate it. Um, we're going to take a 20-minute break. The um, panelists will be up here, so I know other people had some questions. Please come up and ask them. I'm sorry we can't expand the 24-hour day. Um, uh, or, and 20-minute uh, break, and then we're going to come back for the keynote from the professor.